What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit the like button and let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? I am your host. Jeff Naden, we are back for yet another weekly episode of The Sit Down. This is episode 122. And as always, we have another great organized crime topic to get into today. We're going to tell the story of the very interesting Vic Arena. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through the very bloody time that the early 90s was for the Colombo crime family. There were so many people that were caught up in the back and forth between Victor Arena and Carmine Persica. We're going to learn a little bit about the history of Little Vic. We're going to learn about his, to be fair, pretty good relationship with Carmine Persico. And then the ultimate kind of thought when Arena says, you know what? People respect me on the street. I have a high standing. I'm not waiting for Little Alley Boy to get out. This is my family. That would lead to a nearly two-year war. And it would lead to a life sentence for Victor Arena. We're going to talk about that. Not only that, but the old thought of when a mobster really reaches the age of, let's say, 80 years old, do you keep them in prison? And we'll talk about that with Little Vic because there have been a lot of sad things coming out of federal prison about Little Vic and his mental state, where he is. Um, and uh, you know, we're going to get through all the bloody carnage. Before we do that, though, as always, I want to tell you about the great people at my bookie. Now, we've all been there before. You know, you want to take that weekly trip to the casino or you want to play some blackjack or roulette. Well, my bookie's new and improved online casino is here and ready to change the game. Be like me, be like others. Dive into truly realistic casino like Las Vegas experiences where the action's in your hands. You can play everything from slots and progressive jackpots. You get live dealer action, blackjack, roulette, sports betting, whatever you want. There's a brand new collection of high-end games for a chance at real cash rewards. Look, guys, I've talked about it. Football is coming up. In fact, college football has already began. Week one is this week. You've got some great action. You've got you know all the top teams uh, on the, 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 the docket this weekend. It leads off this Thursday. Go bet football. Go get involved. Get on with my bookie. You got to join it right now. And just for joining us and for the adventure starting, you're going to get a generous sign up bonus just by listening to this show. All you have to do is use promo code sit down, all one word that's promo code sit down to secure yourself a 50% match on deposits up to a thousand bucks. So if you put up 500, they're going to give you 250 in sign up bonuses. And again, all you have to do is use promo code sit down when opening your account. And again, that's not all. Just because uh, you're a new uh, person uh, on my bookie, they're going to give you a revamp loyalty program. They get you all sorts of gifts, including free spins, cashback offers, and other VIP perks. The more you play, the more you win. Play like me. Play anytime, anywhere. MyBookie.ag. Use promo code SITDOWN. All right, everybody. Let's get into the episode today. You know we don't waste much time here on the show. I want to just quickly thank all of you as always. I always appreciate hearing from all you guys. And also shout out to all of our friends listening currently through podcasts. If you're listening on iTunes, Google Pods, or Spotify, please make sure you leave us a detailed review. I know a lot of you guys interact with me on Twitter at Sit Down Crime Pod. I really appreciate it. It's always nice to hear from audio and video listeners alike. Let's get into it. Little Vic Arena on the sit down. Victoria Arena was born August 4th, 1934 in the New York borough of Brooklyn. Now, there's not a ton known about Vic Arena's early life, but according to his family, they would say that little Vic's father would actually die when he was a young kid. We can surmise probably in the early 40s. And Vic Arena really had no male around him, which 
you know, again, we've heard hear this time and time again with gangsters, criminals, you know, organized crime people. When you don't have people around you, standard and quality father figures, where do you go? Well, you go to the streets. And the people in the streets become your quasi family. And that's what Little Vic's family would say. They would say that he was really drawn to the streets. He he yearned for that kind of uh, fatherly figure. And the streets were there to provide that for him. Now, at one point during his, you know, let's say early teens, it was said Vic Arena would actually go to reform school uh, due to doing criminal things. Now, we don't obviously have his juvenile record. However, we'd have to think Vic Arena was out running around. Now, This is always the challenge of doing this show. Um, There's a lot of intimate details that I won't have and people like the family of Vic Arena have. Um, Now, Vic Arena had many sons, which we'll talk about. Um, You know, obviously they would know a lot more about his, you know, childhood than I am. Now, some gangsters, there's a more kind of colorful, detailed background where we know what they were doing as kids. We know more about their family, but not a lot is known about Vic Arena's early life. Now, there is a common thought and I have never actually been able to have this truly answered, and I'm not sure we ever will unless someone from the Arena family comes out and tells me. Um, But there is a loose connection familiarly to Vic Arena and actually the Persicos. It was said that Vic Arena is allegedly a distant relative of the Persicos. Now, that would be through some sort of marriage. I don't know who that is. Um, But that is somewhat of a rumor. I've never heard that's actually been uh, clarified, but, you know, it it may lead to the fact that I believe that Vic Arena probably grew up in and around Carroll Gardens, Red Hook in that area. Now, I will say, if you're an old timer, you're from that area, maybe you knew Vic Arena as a kid, feel free to get in touch with me. Obviously, that won't help me much now, but I would like to know. Um, I want to say Vic was from that area, but there's no common uh, knowledge to know that. Now, Vic Arena would really first show up uh, on the radar of law enforcement in and around the late 60s to the early 70s in a Greg Scarpa FBI file in and around 1973. Vic Arena is listed as an associate of the Colombo crime family. He is an associate supposedly in the crew of longtime Colombo capo, Nicholas Jiggs Forlano. Now, Forlano is an old, old, old school guy. I mean, he goes back to the 50s in the mafia. Um, It was said that really at one point, there weren't many bigger loan sharks than Jiggs Forlano. In fact, he was doing a lot of business with his partner, Jewish gangster Ruby Stein. Now, Ruby Stein was a huge loan shark, and these guys were a loan shark to loan sharks. They were the biggest loan sharks. And that's probably where Vic Arena starts moving around in the loan sharking world. And that's where Vic Arena made a lot of his early money. Um, By this point in the late 60s, early 70s, Vic's operating in and out of Queens, Long Island. Um, And look, if you know anything about Forlano, he was involved uh, in Queens. He lived in, I believe, Rigo Park, Queens. uh, And... You know, he was really, I think, one of the early mentors to Vic Arena as, again, he's listed as an associate. Now, one of the interesting things about Forlano is during that time, one of his main people uh, is Benny Alloy, uh, which would wage a long time friendship between uh, Victor Arena and Benny Alloy. Now, certain historical references will say that Vic Arena was made before the books opened in unsanctioned ceremonies by the Colombo crime family. That is not true. Okay. In fact, Vic Arena is made in the mid to late seventies, which we'll get into here in just a second. Now, as I said, Vic was learning the art of loan sharking. It could be major money. You have millions of dollars in the street. You're making free money as long as people are paying you, which again, you're backed by the mob. So you have no issue. Vic Arena is starting to loan out money of his own and he's operating in and out of Queens and Long Island. Now, one of his main people, and I want to thank the great folks at the New York Mafia.com. My guy, the other guy over there, I want to shout him out, my friend, uh, great work. He would actually come across some really cool information that 
one of Vic Arena's main people underneath him was a Jewish gangster, a guy on the left uh, of Casso and Arena, a guy called Bobby Ross. Now, Bobby Ross and Vic Arena were essentially loan shark partners, and they uh, had large swaths of Queens and Long Island on lock. Uh, they had money all over the streets, uh, and um, you know, they would obviously have to pay for that because they would be indicted uh, here in a bit, which we'll talk about. Now, Vic Arena would be arrested in 1976 for perjury. Uh, I searched up and down for some information related to this perjury case. I don't have a lot of info on it. One thing I do know, though, is at one point, Vic Arena is hit by the casino commissions in New Jersey and put on the blacklist. And it would reference a 76 uh, involvement in a perjury case. But I don't know much about it outside of that. Now, Vic Arena would ultimately get the call to become a made member of the mafia once the books are opened in the mid-70s. According to LCN Blogspot, uh, which I've referenced, they are the best when it comes to ceremonies. Uh, they would say that Vic Arena would be made on April 29th, 1977. Now, alongside Arena, um, other gangsters like Little Dom Cataldo, Ralph Scopo Sr., and Nicholas Nicky Black Grancia were all made in the same ceremony. And by 1980, it was said that Vic Arena uh, was in the crew of Alphonse Persico. Now, from what I know, Alphonse Persico would also sponsor Vic Arena into the family. By this point, Vic Arena is a married man. Now, that is a great photo of Vic Arena. That is when he is a much younger man, um, but he was married by this point. I don't have the exact date of Vic Arena's marriage. He's born in 34 we have to think that in this photo, he's probably mid-20s, something in the 60s. He was married, um, and here he can be seen with his bride. So Vic Arena is a made member. He has a huge loan sharking book. He is connected with uh, the purse goes. Things are good. I mean, Vic Arena was a very accomplished member by this point. He's moving around. He's connected with people like Benny Alloy, his brother, uh, Vinny Alloy. And really, by the 80s, he is not only making money, he's moving his territories, but he's waging relationships with other families, including uh, the Lucchese family. Here he is with uh, Anthony Casso. It was also said that Vic Arena was uh, connected and close to John Gotti. Um, and that was something we would learn through some of the involvement of the Colombo crime family in the infamous guest tax scheme. Now, we have heard about the gas tax scheme extens uh, extensively from Michael Franzese, who was making tons of money in the gas tax scheme. But another person that was making a lot of money in the gas tax scheme was Vic Arena. In fact, by this point, Arena is you know making a bunch of money in loan trucking, but his son, Victor Arena Jr., is said to be the point man in the gas tax scheme with other members of the Colombo crime family, that Vic Arena was making millions of dollars through the gas tax scheme as well. And we would learn that through a really intri intrinsical kind of a web of accounts that Vic Arena allegedly had that was being managed by this guy, a financial wizard called Dennis Papas. Now, Papas was said to be an incredible financial mind. And he had dozens of accounts, in fact, hundreds of accounts and multiple shell companies set up for Victor Arena to launder gas profits, as well as loan checking profits, club profits that he had, bar profits that he had. Vic Arena was a very powerful and man that made a lot of money. I mean, it was pretty simple. Um, now, in and around this time, Vic Arena becomes a capo regime in the Colombo crime family. I mean, this has to do with members of the Persco family going away to prison. And again, during the mid 80s, Arena was making his way up the family. He was a trusted guy. He was doing what he had to do. He was making a lot of money. And Persco viewed him as someone that he could kind of trust at this point. Now, 
as we know. I mean, it wouldn't take long because that would change. Um, and what we also find out is that Persco kind of creates uh, a ruling body, if you will, in the family. Now, for Carmen Persco, we knew what he wanted to do because he was always very um, connected to his family and he wanted his blood family to lead the pack. Carmen Persco was never getting out of prison, but he viewed the mantle was next going to belong to his son, Alphonse Little Alley Boy Persco. The problem was Little Alley Boy in the late 80s was hit with 12 years in prison. So what Carmen Persco wants to do is he wants to kind of keep a seat warm for his son. So when his son comes out, he'll be the guy. So what he does, Persco, is he institutes the street bosses as Benny Alloy, Joe Tomasello, and a guy called Vincent Jimmy Angelino. Now, the good thing for Arena is he's a captain and his kind of let's just say skipper at this point is Benny Alloy, who's now kind of the ruling panel of this family. But what Arena starts realizing by the late 80s is he alongside Benny Alley, they kind of say, you know what? We're respected on the street. We have many people under us, including, you know, Carmine Sessa, um, you know, Bill Cotolo, all these people. They have a strong faction. And what they start doing is they only start making people from their faction. The other Carmine Persco faction, Arena says, screw this guy. He's away. I don't give a shit about his son. He ain't coming home for a while. This is my family. And I have a lot of allegiance. People like me in this family. I'm powerful. I'm making a lot of money. And again, his connections to people like John Gotti were helping his cause because he had not only the Gambino family kind of next to him, but the Bonanos were kind of connected to him too. So Arena believes he could take this family over. And what he also does is he starts killing people that are connected to the Persco group. One of the people he decides to whack in 1988 is a guy called Vincent Jimmy Angelino. Angelino's on the ruling body. He's a Persco guy. He's an old school guy. Uh, he made a lot of money for the family. He's basically consigliere of the Colombo family. There's a lot of talk that, you know, he wasn't willing to kind of get involved and, and get down. Um, there was talk that basically... Vic Arena wanted to install Carmine Sessa as the new consigliere and make it a clean sweep across the board. And he wanted the new family to look like this. He wanted him at the top, Vic Arena. His UB would be Alloy. And his third would be Carmine Sessa. So it would be all Arena people. But he's got to get Vincent Jimmy Angelino out of the way. So what he does is he sets the murder um, up. So on November 28, 1988, Fat Dennis DeLuca would pick up Vincent Angelina from the Garment District, and they would drive to the New Jersey home of Colombo-made man Ray Cagno, who's on the left. He has a home in New Jersey, and he's based in New Jersey. They walk Jimmy Angelina up the steps, and at the top of the steps are in the middle Carmine Sessa and Bill Cotolo, and they whack Jimmy Angelino. So now it is the Arena crime family, basically. And Arena is very strong. But what this does is this is kind of the start of a war developing. So everything was good up until, you know, Carmine Persco realizes that, wait, I've created a monster here and Arena's got a ton of backing on the street and I'm way out in California and my son's in prison. And I really have no legs to fucking stand on here. And I'm in deep. Now, the thing for Persco is he realized that he had people on the streets as well. The problem is, though, too, remember, by this point, Jerry Lang's off the street. Donnie Shax is off the street. Ralph Scopo's off the street. So Persico had to hang on, though. And what we would learn is Persco actually, they won this war, which we'll get into, but it would go back and forth. Now, the war would really start in the early 90s. But before we get to that, not only is Vic Arena killing Jimmy Angelino, but he would also kill another Persico loyalist, Tommy O'Sara. Now, Tommy O'Sara was an old school 
uh, boxer. He would come, become a made member in the family. Tommy O'Sara had a catering hall out on Long Island called The Manor, which at one point, um, Vic Arena was running business out of that place. He kills Tommy O'Sara as well. In fact, he orders Greg Scarpa to choke Tommy O'Sara with a piano chord. Um, and that is something you guys want to remember. The O'Sara hit is very important to the long-term prospects for Vic Arena. But things are good. In 1991, it's the Arena crime family. Vic Arena's acting boss and essentially official boss. They're not recognizing Persico anymore. His underboss is Benny Alloy, and his consigliere is Carmine Sessa. Now, this is where the war kind of gets started. In and around June of 1991, Victor Arena is at uh, one of his clubs in Long Island. Arena comes home uh, to his home in the area of Buckingham Road in um, Cedarhurst, Long Island. Now, obviously, if you can tell by this map, Cedarhurst is very close to Queens. And this is what and kind of where Arena had always set up business. He was around Queens, you know, right near the border to Long Island. He comes home, but he realizes that there are Persico gunmen waiting for him. And this is where the war starts for Vic Arena. Now, he obviously isn't shot or anything, but Arena realizes it's on. And for the next year and a half, these guys will go back and forth. Now, what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to go through all the big events in this waging war. And it was wild. I mean, 91, like summer of 91 until like late 92 is crazy. I mean, Christmas of 91, it was a fucking shooting gallery in Brooklyn, which we'll talk about. The first person that the Arena faction wanted to take out was, I think, really the prize target. Now, the two prize targets on both sides, as far as guys in the street, because remember, Victor Arena is not out there shooting people. Benny Allo is not out there shooting people. The main shooters on both sides for the Arena faction, the top guy was Bill Cotolo. And Cotolo was very involved, which we'll talk about, in a lot of things. He was the main kind of big fish that Arena had on the street. Now, for Carmen Persco, his main guy out there was Gregory Scarpa. Now, we know Greg Scarpa uh, was a very feared hitman for the mafia. But one thing we also know is throughout this whole time, he is a mob informant and he's out there shooting people, but also giving information. It's a wild situation. Now, the first person to be shot at was Greg Scarpa. That would happen in November of 1991. He would be shot at, you know, at in Brooklyn. He survives, you know, doesn't hit or anything. Now, just days later, underboss for Arena, Benedetto Alloy, is coming out of a club in Queens, and he is shot at. He's not hit. So the first two shootings involve high-profile people on both sides. No deaths yet. Now, the first death in the war would come just days later from the Alloy attempted shooting. It would happen on November 24th. A Persico loyalist who had just been made, a guy called Henry Hank the Bank Schmura, would be shot and killed in Sheepshed Bay, Brooklyn, allegedly by Bill Cotolo and his group. So the first murder can be attributed and benefit the arena side. So they get the first chalk uh, in this murder back and forth. Now, on November 28th, four days later, Fat Larry Sessa, who is a Persco loyalist, and an associate, Ron Calder, are shot at in Brooklyn. So the arena side's kind of doing their thing the first couple shootings. On December 5th, 1991, about a week later, old-time Persco loyalist Rosario Black Sam Nastasi is killed as he sits in a social club in the area of 985 63rd Street in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Now, the sad thing about this is Black Sam Nastasi goes way back. He was about 80 years old at this point. He's playing cards in a social club. His young girlfriend uh, is there. She's actually grazed in this shooting. 
So the early onslaught is hitting the Persco group hard. I mean, they have a couple of guys that are killed. Shmura's killed. Black Sam Nastasi's killed. Everything kind of goes back and forth. So these are the first two deaths. Now, according to other members, including a Genovese guy who was shot and caught in the crossfire of this, other families are actively telling their people, Genovese, Gambino, stay the fuck away from Brooklyn. These guys are back and forth. A war's not good for us. It's bad business. But these guys are shooting it out cowboy style on the streets. Now, the next murder would happen on December 8th, uh, 1991, according to Gregory Scarpa, um, they would shoot and kill an arena faction member called Vincent Fusaro. Now, Vinny Fusaro was an arena loyalist. He's out putting Christmas lights up in front of his home. Scarpa spots him and they whack him in his front lawn. So Merry Christmas. Now on the same day, on December 8th, this is where the Arena faction starts taking some hits. An individual in the Arena faction, a person called Louis Bobo Malpizo, his son, Jimmy, is shot at. And that is a message to Bobo Malpizo. Now, Malpizo was a nutty guy. Malpizo is furious. He runs to an Arena captain called Patsy or Patty Amato. Amato approves, do what you got to do. Take out one of their guys. So Malpizo alongside Joey Amato and a father-son hit team called Anthony and Chris Libertor, they are stalking Colombo Persico people. They decide and settle on Francis Guerra, who is a Persico loyalist. And they realize that, Malpizo realizes that Guerra has a bagel sh uh, shop in Brooklyn. I think it's called one a bagel or something, something stupid. So they go to this bagel shop. And don't break my balls about how I say bagel, by the way. I'm that's how I say it, bagel, whatever. Uh, so they go in, they believe Gare is at this location. Liberator, this young arena hitman, is set into the bagel shop. Um, that's on December 8th. Now there's a young kid working there at the time, a kid called Matteo Sparenza. Libertor walks in and says, hey, where's Gara? The kid says he ain't here. What do you want from him? Now, Libertor claims that Sparenza is like reaching underneath the counter. Libertor mistakes that he has a gun and kills him in cold blood. Here you can see a police officer uh, surveying the scene. Now, remember, listen to what I just said. Sparenza is 17 years old. He's an innocent kid. He's whacked. And this kind of starts to send shockwaves through Brooklyn because they're just killing everybody. Now I understand people are being caught up in this. This was a bad look for Malpizo, Joey Amato, all those guys. Now the Arena faction would then catch up to their favorite target, Greg Scarpa, yet again. On December 30th, 1991, Gregory Scarpa is stalked to the home of his daughter, little Linda Scarpa. Now, now little Linda's talked about this. She's done interviews, and she's talked about she alongside her young son, who she's carrying, and Greg Scarpa get into separate cars. She's following her father. And a, a hitman descend on his car and shoot at him. He then survives again. Somehow, he makes it out of it. They're going back and forth, these guys. It's pretty crazy. And Greg Scarpa has been shot at twice. And like a cat with nine lives, he survives. Now, the Scarpa faction would get back at the Arena faction for this attempted, again, assassination in front of Scarpa's daughter. On January 7th, 1992, Greg Scarpa and his favorite hitter, Larry Mazza locate the biggest target yet. They find Nick, Nikki Black Grancio in Brooklyn. And Mazza has talked about this very openly. He would cooperate down the road. And he talked about the fact that 
Greg and him were just driving around pretending to be cops looking for Colombo people, Persco pe or uh, Arena people. Uh, and they spot Grand CEO. Now, this is a big fish because Grand CEO is a high level Arena guy. A lot of people believed he'd be upper management soon. He's a big local in the Teamsters, making a lot of money. And Massa claims that he's blown away because Grancy is just out collecting money like nothing's going on. And he spots Mazza and Scarpa, but thinks they're cops. And Mazza talks about they drive right up to Grancio and Scarpa's gun malfunctions. And Mazza just shoots him right in the head. And he said he saw, you know, you know, body matter, you know, splatter on the, uh, uh, the windshield. And this was the biggest hit yet. This was a major issue for the Arena faction. I mean, Grancia was a high-ranking guy. Now, in February of 1992, Gregory Scarpa is starting to get a little bit on a roll here because he spots Arena loyalist Joel Joe Waverly Kikase in Brooklyn, shoots at Joe Waverly, but Joe Waverly survives. He drives himself, I believe, to a hospital. Now, the Arena... Faction would then take another hit. Long Island heavyweight John Minerva is shot and killed in uh, Massapequa, I believe. Now, a lot of people believe that John Minerva was shot by Dino Calabro, who was with Tommy Schatz at the time. Tommy Schatz is a Persco loyalist. He's very connected to Mush Russo, very, very respected Persco guy. In March of 1992, two days later, Tommy Schatz is in Long Island with Joe Monteleone. They are shot at multiple times, and Tommy Joelli survives. This is where he gets the nickname Tommy Schatz. So it's back and forth. Like one guy's killed, they go back. Like it's back and forth. This is waging. Now, our old friend Malpiso is up to no good again. This time, though, in April of 92, Malpizo is shot at but survives. He then, just days later, or sorry, a month later in 1992, he shoots at the individual that shoots at him, Tommy McLaughlin. Now, McLaughlin is with the Tommy Shots crew. Now, in the commission of shooting at McLaughlin, Malpizo actually shoots an unsuspecting 15-year-old kid called Daniel Norden. Luckily, Daniel Norden survives. Malpizo is taken off the street. Malpizo would ultimately get like a 75-year sentence and died in prison in 2003. But Malpizo was very involved in multiple shootings in this. Remember, he was directly involved with the shooting of an innocent 17-year-old. He then was involved just shooting all over the place and hitting a 15-year-old innocent bystander. Luckily, he survived. But Malpizo was extremely reckless. He didn't care about anything. He didn't care about anything. Now, during all this, I mean, Greg Arena, or uh, Greg Arena, Greg Scarpa is killing Arena people. He would then, in May of 1992, kill Larry Lampese Jr., who was an Arena loyalist as well. So Greg Scarpa is a one-man wrecking crew. Keep in mind, by this point, he has AIDS. He's you know, all over the place, according to Larry Mazza. And remember, during this time, Greg Scarpa is also fighting his son, Greg Scarpa Jr.'s battles. Remember the, uh, I talked about it in this video about Mikey Flat Top DeRosa. During all this, Greg Scarpa shooting it out with young hoods in Brooklyn who are going at his, uh, his son. He shoots at Mikey DeRosa and uh, Ronald Moran and is blinded, I believe, at one point. He's shot in the eye and survives. Guys, I always say this. Greg Scarpa is the most interesting mobster of all time to me. Look, was he a rat? Yes. But he's extremely interesting. He's got AIDS. He's shooting people. He's bleeding all over the place. He's killing high-level people during this war. I mean, the early 90s, Greg Scarpa, look, whether or not you want to give him a respect, he was a fucking legend, a hood legend. He's out shooting people with as he has AIDS. He's like deformed by this point. He doesn't look anything like uh, he used to. I mean, he's just a, a lunatic. Um, now, 
there would be several smaller incidents that would happen in summer of 92, but the war is starting to die down. And a lot of that had to do with the fact that in April of 1992, Victor Reyna is arrested finally by the federal government. And this leads back to racketeering, loan sharking, weapons offenses, and the murder that he ordered of Tommy Osera back in 1989. So the government jams him up. Now, the war would officially end in October of 1993 when Arena underboss Joseph Scopo is shot and killed outside of his Ozone Park home by a young upstart Colombo Persco sympathizer, John Papa. Now, John Papa was doing a bunch of his own shit, and he was trying to get points with the Persco faction, and they go and kill um, Joseph Scopo. So in the end, when we look at 12 people died in the Third Colombo War, but when we look at the people that were killed that had the most standing, Joe Scopo was an underboss of the Arena faction. He's killed. Nikki Black was a high rank guy, Reina guy. He was killed. John Minerva was a main guy. He was killed. Larry Lambesi was killed. I mean, the Reina faction took some early successes, but by the end, they were kind of destroyed. And when you look at the Persco faction, the fact that they actually won the war is pretty impressive. Because again, let's remember Carmen Persco is locked up. Little Alley Boy is locked up. Donnie Shax is locked up. You know, Jerry Lang's locked up. Look at the Arena faction. Cotolo, Cacase, all these guys. Again, this goes back to the success of Greg Scarpa. I mean, Scarpa was just a guy that had nine lives, man. He really was. He's the most interesting guy in the history of the mob to me. He really is. When you really think about the life that Greg Scarpa lived, he won the war single-handedly for the Persco faction. And what we would see is what happened. By the mid-90s, cooler heads prevail. Arena is off the street. And they start kind of working together. And say, you know what? Little Alley Boy gets out. He becomes new boss. He makes Bill Cotolo, an Arena guy, you know, a high-ranking underboss. Everything's good. But back to Vic Arena. Victor Arena when he is convicted of racketeering and ordering the murder of Tommy Osera in 1992, December of 92, um, that would be the last time we would ever see him on the streets. Um, he would ultimately be hit and receive life in prison plus 85 years. Um, and to this day, Vic Arena is still in prison. Vic Arena in 1997 would file an appeal. Now, this would have to do with what we would learn from, obviously, Gregory Scarpa, who would be outed as an informant, um, Carmine Sessa flipped, Larry Mazza flipped. And a lot of this had to do, at least for Vic Arena, appealing the fact that we would find out that Lynn DeVecchio, who was Scarpa's handler, was dirty. Um, and look, I'll say to this day, I'll do a video on Lynn DeVecchio at some point. Lynn DeVecchio should be serving life in prison. Uh, he allowed Gregory Scarpa to do some awful things. And we'd also ultimately beat the rap. So I guess we have to respect the court of law. But Linda Vecchio is a scumbag. I mean, everybody knows that. And Vic Arena believed, his lawyers believed, that he could maybe get out of prison due to this. But it didn't work. In fact, um, De Vecchio, as I said, would beat the rap. Now, Vic Arena would again in January of 2004 file another appeal, but it was denied. Now, Vic Arena, it was said, got his high school degree, I believe, at some point in prison. He also would become a Eucharistic minister for the Catholic Church. And it was really said that throughout his prison time, Vic Arena was a model prisoner um, and, you know, has spent a long time in prison. Um, he has had very few, if any, uh, disciplinary issues. Here, Vic Arena can be seen in prison, uh, a prison visiting area with his son, Andrew Arena. Now, we would see some pretty interesting photos pop up of Vic Arena over the years. Here, he can be seen with 
uh, Buffalo drug kingpin, Sly Green. Uh, now, Donald Green is a uh, very high-level drug trafficker, but this is when they're both in prison. I mean, there's no issue in taking photos with people. Vic is an old man by this point. Um, now, the problem that Vic Arena would ultimately have is, like everyone, he got old. And really, by the mid-2010s, Vic Arena would have Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, heart disease, and more. And he was actually... Um, and is still actually in a wheelchair. He would be transferred to the Federal Medical Center for federal prisoners in Devons, Massachusetts. Now, Victor Arena's family has implored the judge in the case to send Arena home. Now, he has five sons, 20 grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. And that the family, quote, lived for the moment he would be released from prison and they're prepared to bring him home and provide a fully supportive, loving home for him, addressing all of his mental health and physical needs conditions. Now, his son, Andrew, would say in a letter that they beg for mercy for his father and that his ailing dad is a shell of the man he once was. And they want a, quote, happy ending to a tragic family saga in which his children lost everything he once had except his sons, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. And he would also say that, quote, his dad grew up without a father, and he was lured into a life that both helped him and destroyed him. Now, his granddaughter Jacqueline would also write to the judge saying, quote, we ask for humane and compassionate decisions to be made, and that she was two years old, when her grandfather went away, quote, please release us from the life sentence. Our entire family has been serving over the last three decades. Now, Vicar Mo or Vicar Reina has filed for multiple compassionate releases, most notably in July of 2023. Now, according to the lawyers for Vic Arena, they would say that his mental state is so bad that he claims that he is, quote, the warden of the prison and is also president of the United States. Now, according also to a very interesting article that I've read recently uh, by a person called Katie Engelhart, she would write a interesting piece called, I've reported on dementia for years, and one image of a prisoner keeps haunting me. And she would write that for the New York Times. And the prisoner that haunted her was Victor Arena. And this is the age-old question that we have with people in the American prison system that are over the age of 80 years old. Should they be released? That has always been the question. Now, when we look at two different Vicks, let's look at Vic Amuso and Vic Arena. Vic Amuso and Anthony Castle ordered a dozen murders, you know, directly were involved in the overtaking of power. They did a lot of bad shit. I don't probably think Vic Amuso should be let out. But then I also say to myself, well, he didn't actually commit the murders. He's not what he once was. I think the issue that we have with Vic Amuso is, up until like five years ago, Vic Amuso was still in conversation with members of the Lucchese crime family. When we look at Vic Arena, Victor Arena probably doesn't even know what the mafia is at this point. He doesn't and is not a threat to society. The only person Vic Arena is a threat to is himself. And the problem we have, particularly in the federal prison system, is it does not, it's not capable of providing quality treatment to people like Vic Arena. It just isn't. And when we look at his five sons, they all do pretty well. I'm sure they can provide him much better care. What sense is it to keep Vic Arena in prison? I mean, seriously, it is completely pointless at this point. He is not a member of the mafia anymore. It's really only by name only. Vic Arena probably couldn't even tell you. He is essentially Junior Soprano. In the last episodes, 
He doesn't know who his son is. He doesn't know who his grand. He probably wouldn't even couldn't even tell you who um, you know, John Gotti is at this point. He doesn't know who anyone is. He thinks he's the president, for God's sakes. I think this is sad. And I feel bad for his family. I do. I truly do. I mean, his grandkid, his grandkids never really knew him other than prison visits. And let's be real. I mean, you know, he's not going to cause any harm. Now the government's looking at it and saying, what do they normally say? We hate the mafia. Look at all the, look at the war that how many people died, 12 people died in the war. And the war wouldn't have happened if not for Vic Arena. So I guess I understand the government's point of view, but there has to be at some point, I think, a look and a case by case basis of every, and I think the government's kind of saying, you know what? That's how it is now. But when it comes to you being a essentially boss of the mafia, something we hate, we're not going to go over and bend over backwards to let you out. So that's kind of where we are. Um, Vic Amuso, I keep saying Vic Amuso. Vic Arena, he's also in jail, not getting out. It's likely that Vic Arena will die in federal prison. I mean, he is approaching his 90th birthday. Um, and uh, that's that. Uh, he's 89 years old. Now, I do want to kind of end this with kind of a cool reference. Um, and I, I really only reference this because I really like his music. And I think if you like rap music and good beats and quality lyricism, and guys, again, I wouldn't steer in the wrong direction when it comes to rap. Um, but Vic Arena has a grandson uh, who goes by the name aptly Little Vic. Uh, he's a very accomplished rapper and producer. He's made some really grimy, just great beats. Um, he, I've heard him in all sorts of interviews. He's really connected, knows a bunch of people, and is actually really talented. I mean, he's rapped with guys like Vinny Paz. Um, he's rapped on beats by DJ Premier, who is, in my eyes, one of the greatest producers of all time. And what I find interesting about Little Vic, the rapper, is he generally – talks very openly about the mafia in his lyrics. You know, he has album covers with Tony Salerno on them. Um, you know, he talks about his grandfather. Um, he's actually pretty, pretty good. Um, and I urge you to go check out his uh, music and, and all his different stuff. He's really a great rapper. So kind of a cool story uh, to end this, but um, I will say, I mean, I, I think it's sad that Vic Arena is still in jail. I mean, as we know, he is not, He's not the same person. He doesn't even know who he is, probably. So, and he doesn't. He thinks he's the president, for Christ's sakes. Um, but I guess the people like the family of Tommy O'Sara and the family of, you know, whoever, they say, well, our dad was important too. And he didn't get to live out his life. So, I guess, what do you think? Should Vic Arena be let out of prison? I guess if you let him out, you got to let them all out. And I don't think the government wants to send that precedent. So a wild time. You know, I, I know people always say the Colombo family are this, they're that, um, but they are damn interesting. You know, uh, that era where Vic Arena kind of grows from humble beginnings, becomes a very rich man and says, you know what? Fuck Carmen Persco. I'll take this family over. In the end, though, he would lose. However, he has outlived Persco. Persco died a couple of years ago. So I'm sure Vic Arena, if he were in a good mental state, would tell you it was just business. They were friends at one point, maybe even relatives. But power is very important, and it's the almighty in the mob world. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you're listening to us on audio, I hope you enjoyed this show. Uh, please make sure, as always, you hit that like button. Make sure you subscribe. Um, before we go, guys. I want to kind of update you on something next week, um, which I'm really excited about. On Thursday, August 31st, I am conducting one of the bigger interviews I'll ever do. Um, and uh, what we're going to do is we are going to bring someone out of the shadows that has never spoken to anybody about his time in the mafia. He is um, a guy who did a lot of time. He's committed multiple murders, and he is now living somewhere in America um, 
and he's going to talk to me. So we're going to do that live. We're going to do that at a certain location, and uh, we are going to uh, tell a story. So I urge you to get excited about next week. That'll drop next week, God willing. We don't have any production issues or anything, but stay tuned and look forward to that. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.